Hello again. Those of you that joined me last time know that I was talking about ancient American civilizations that took root in Mesoamerica, or the central part of the Americas. Um, today we're going to turn our attention to the native societies that were indigenous to uh, North America, that is, present-day United States and Canada. But before we do, I want to review some of the issues that we left off with the last time. There was a really important term that I mentioned the last time um, I met with you, <clears throat> and that was the American exception, or American exceptionalism. Now, first of all, this is really going to be a key term, not just for these couple of lectures, but it's going to be something that we revisit throughout the semester. And as a matter of fact, it's going to be very important for your final exam. So please don't put this out of sight, out of mind. Now, to that end, um, one of the things that I wanted you to understand about American exceptionalism, especially as it relates to Native North America, is that we are all immigrants. Um, it doesn't matter if your family came over on the Mayflower, if your family came over and was processed through Ellis Island, if your family emigrated from Mexico in the 1950s, it doesn't matter if you can prove that you're 100% Native American. And by the way, you probably cannot do that. I don't care what Ancestry.com has to say. But even if you could prove that, the evidence, both historical and archaeological, is indicating that even 100% Native Americans came from somewhere else. Now, we were talking about this through things like the Bering Strait, the land bridge from uh, Siberia, Russia, to Alaska, and we think that's where the earliest inhabitants of the Americas came from. In other words, they were migrants too. Part of what makes America exceptional when you compare it to other great civilizations of the past is that there really isn't a DNA makeup. That there's, there's, there's no one identifiable American. Um, some people might con find that controversial. I kind of look at that as common sense. Um, if you look at American history, um, you can very clearly see it. Okay? If you look at American culture, you can clearly see it. And if you look at Native American societies, you can also see it. Staying with that theme, the American exception, I want to talk to you about the Native societies of the North. Let me point something out very quickly here. The societies that you see take root in places like upstate New York, or what is present-day upstate New York, uh, New Mexico, um, places like the Great Plains, they are less complex than the societies we were talking about in Central America last time. They're smaller. I mentioned that whereas Mesoamerica had 40,000, or excuse me, 40 million inhabitants, uh, North American societies only totaled right around about 7 million. So they're smaller. Now, as they are smaller, they've got a lot more autonomy. They're a lot more self-governing. In other words, whereas you saw these high priests, these rulers, these emperors in ancient Maya, ancient Azteca, you tended not to see them in places like um, the Iroquois Nation or uh, the Pueblo peoples of the Southwest. More times than not, what you saw were lineage-based societies. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I basically mean is um, the power to do something, whether that be make a decision or whether that be farm a field, was generally handed down from one generation to the next. And it was your family's uh, previous history that gave you that power. Um, so, what I'd like to do is point out a, a few. I, I can't to everybody because we'd be here all semester and it really wouldn't be an American history class it would be a Native American history class which is certainly worth the while but not really what we're doing anyway I'm going to mention a few different Native societies that were indigenous to North America before Europeans showed up the first I'd like you to be mindful of is the Algonquian peoples okay now the Algonquians were not necessarily a people per se they were more or less a group of individuals uh, that spoke the Algonquian language, okay? Now, these are individuals that were native to the New England or Great Lakes region, so a pretty vast stretch of territory there. 
Now, unlike their Aztec or Mayan counterparts, most of these people lived in a hunter, uh, fisher, subsistence, excuse me, subsistence sort of life. And to that end, they were organized at a village level. Okay. Now, a lot of their dwellings have really come to define Native American life in um, this period. Huts, not teepees, huts. Um, long, um, almost picture like an airplane hangar. That, that's kind of what I'm talking about. And they were really well known for their construction of these uh, dwelling huts. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Haudenosaunee, um, a, a, a group of people that certainly would have fell within the Algonquian uh, orbit, um, were, were very famous for their long houses. Those of you that have been to the Boston area, um, those of you that have gone with Mountain View on the Boston excursion, can speak from experience about some of these huts. They're very long. Um, they have like a bench-like um, structure like a bench that, um, that, that surrounds the entire room. So you have something to sit on, and typically these are cushioned um, by animal skins. So if you wanted to lay down on one, you could. And in the middle of these things, what you'd have is a fire. Now, in some instances, it's meant for keeping warm, obviously. In some instances, it's meant for um, smoking things like meat. Um, other, it's got a variety of different functions. <coughs> Now, the last thing I want you to understand about the Algonquians, or really Native North America, generally speaking, is um, something that dispels a common stereotype, a common myth. I bet many of you, when you think Native American, you think of the what I like to call the tree-hugging Indian, right? As uh, Hollywood has been quick to point out, Native Americans have never done anything to alter their surroundings. They've lived at one with nature. Well, it may be true that they weren't burning fossil fuels at an exorbitant level, but Native Americans understood that when you burnt down a forest, not only did you make way for, you know, more living accommodations, not only did you clear land for growing crops, you also fertilized the, the, the soil. My, my point with this is their slash and burn um, approach to clearing fields was you know, them altering their surroundings. It was them manipulating Mother Nature and their environment. I guess the point that I'm trying to make is very similar to the Mayans or the Aztecs. Um, Native people have a lot more in common with the West, with Western Europe in particular, than a lot of people of the modern variety are um, able to point out. The next group that I want you to be mindful of would be the Kusa Chieftain. Now, first of all, the, the, the Kusa had long gone away by the time that um, people like the Spanish or the French started showing up. So what you're really talking about is an ancient civilization, the Kusa chiefdom. But a couple things about the Kusa I'd like you to know. First of all, the geography. Think about the southwestern part, or excuse me, the southeastern part of the United States. Okay? Think about western Georgia all the way, let, let's call it to Missouri. That, that's a pretty accurate um, description of the geography. Now, what I'd like you to know about the Kusa is they have been described as Little Egypt. Why? Well, what comes to mind when you, I say the word Egypt? What structure, what buildings, what is really emblematic in your mind? The pyramids, right? So the reason that the Kusa was called the Little Egypt was because they were great mound builders. And to this day, you can still go to that part of the United States and see these great mounds. Um, what those mounds actually are were ancient temples and uh, similar to the Aztecs and similar to the Egyptians. What you would have is a high ruler uh, that would rule from the highest point of um, any, given, any, any, any given metropolitan area. Now, speaking of a metropolitan area, Cahokia, okay? This is a key term, and I need you to be mindful of it. Cahokia um, was the largest metropolitan area in North America before Europeans showed up. It was a trading center, it was a cultural center, and um, we're only beginning to understand exactly what Cahokia was and what it meant to uh, the people of North America before, um, before Europeans showed up. But there was all kinds of interesting things that had been found there. For example, copper. Now, why is copper important? Well, copper is not very um, 
not, 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 not very indigenous to St. Louis, which is where Cahokia, that's the best way I have to describe where Cahokia would, would, would have been, the St. Louis area. Anyway, the only way that you can get copper from, you know, the upper peninsula of Michigan all the way down to St. Louis was if you have vast, extensive, and complicated trading networks. So the Kusa and all the people that descended from them were great, great traders. Lastly, it's the Kusa that um, um, were the, uh, the, the, their descendants, is what I'm trying to say, were the Cherokees, okay? So the Cherokee, the modern day tribe of the Cherokee Native Americans, they can trace their roots all the way back to the, the Kusa. Let's talk about the Wyandotte, okay? Now, the word Wyandotte in the Native American language means dwellers of the peninsula. Now, what peninsula am I talking about? Southwestern Ontario. You know, think of Toronto, okay? Um, if you think about that part of what is now Canada, it's a long, skinny peninsula, and it was once upon a time the whole home of a group of Native Americans called the Wyandotte. What I want you to understand about the Wyandotte, they were not a tribe. They were a confederacy, okay? Now, a confederation basically means a loose alliance, a loose organization of affiliated members. In this case, it would be tribes. Now, anytime you've got that, you've, you've got a lot of cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. In other words, there's a lot of people that are claiming power. How do you organize something like that? Well, what the Wyandots did is they organized something called a constitution. Now, that word ought to jump out at you, a constitution. If you think about the American Constitution, all the Constitution says is what branch of government is responsible for what power, what decision-making ability, what have you. It spells out what the Supreme Court is supposed to do, whereas what the um, um, uh, 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 executive branch of government, the legislative branch of government is designed to do, and it puts limits on various powers within there. That's what the Wyandotte Constitution did. Here's my point. The Wyandots were practicing a form of democracy a long time before democracy became cool with the West, so to speak. Now, think about this, okay? One of the things that makes America an exception to something like ancient Rome, um, certainly something like ancient Persia, was it's a people's rule. The, the people have a say in their day-to-day -day life. Well, the Wyandot were doing some form of that a long time before this had caught on in places like Great Britain, let alone the United States. So the Wyandot are a very, very good example of what makes America a great exception to the general trend of civilizations of the past. Now, it's not just the Wyandots that are doing this. In um, you know, a, a world away, basically, in the, what is now present-day um, New Mexico, there was a group of people that historians refer to as the Pueblo peoples. Now, if you've ever picked up a National Geographic or if you watch like the Learning Channel or something like that, you'll see these, um, the, the best way that I have to describe them are like apartment complexes that are carved out of the side of a mountain, like a ravine. Um, think about the landscape of the American Southwest. That's the Pueblo people, okay? These are people that made a civilization out of a, one of the most rugged terrains in the world. Now, you think about that. That's a lot of unpredictable weather. It's a pretty harsh climate. It's going to take a lot of intergroup um, cooperation, individual cooperation with other individuals. Again, one of the ways that you do this, similar to the Wyandotte, is you spread power more evenly throughout the society. You give people a little bit more discretionary ability, a little bit more autonomy. I like to refer to this as wiggle room. You give them a little bit of power over ruling their everyday life. Now the Pueblos are important for that reason, but what the Pueblos would do is they would have these things called moieties, all right? And all a moiety is is a ruling group. So in the summer, there would be one group of rulers that would call the shots and they would make decisions and they would enforce laws and what have you. And then when winter rolled around, you would have a new group of leaders that would come in and they would replace your summer leaders. So the Pueblos are really important because, like the Wyandotte, they're practicing a form of democracy because it's sharing the power. It's very different than what you saw in ancient Azteca or ancient Maya. So it, it, it speaks to the concept of America, the great exception,
on a number of different levels. The last group that I want to mention before we move on would be the Iroquois. Now, in some ways, I've already mentioned the Iroquois. Uh, they would have fallen within the orbit of the Algonquian peoples as well. In other words, they spoke the Algonquian language, or a form of it anyway. Anyway, the Iroquois, the geography upstate New York. Think about um, uh, uh, the, the northern and western part of what is now New York State. Now, one of the things that really struck the Europeans when um, they showed up, in particular the English and the French, was that similar to the Wyandots, um, the Iroquois practiced a form of democracy. They shared power much more evenly throughout their society than someone like ancient Azteca would have. To that end, they created something called the Iroquois League, and that's another really important key term. What the Iroquois League was was a similar variation on the Wyandotte um, Confederation. It was a group of people that uh, spoke the Iroquois language, they practiced Iroquois culture, uh, religion, things of that sort, but they were independent kind of states. Those of you that have taken a Western Civilization course or maybe a World History course, you'll have a background on ancient Greece, and you know that the ancient Greeks all spoke the Greek language, they practiced the Greek religion and so forth, but they thought of themselves as um, Athenians or Cretans or Spartans or Corinthians or things of that sort. Um, in other words, you, the overarching culture mattered, but not as much as who you were on a much more local level. That's very similar to the Iroquois League. But just like the Wyandots, you need to get along with your neighbors. And before the Europeans had got there, there was a series of vicious civil wars amongst the Iroquois people. One of the ways that they found was helpful when it comes to getting along was establishing this Iroquois League, which, just like the Pueblos and the Wyandots, helped to spread power out much more evenly throughout uh, that part of North America. And um, this is very important because, again, it is a form of democracy. So what I want you to walk away from this lecture understanding are several points, and I'll try to highlight these as best I can. The people who were indigenous to North and to a lesser extent Central America were immigrants themselves. It speaks volumes to the America the Great Exception. Um, they were following this migratory pattern of wild game, and eventually they were cut off of the rest of uh, the known world. So for 3,000 years, they didn't know that Europe existed, and Europe didn't know that they existed. But in the meantime, they created these really complicated, very diverse, very complex societies uh, that were complete with their own religions, their own culture, and their own economies. Similar to Europe, Asia, Africa, Native American societies varied substantially on whatever region that you're talking about. It's not a coincidence that the Pueblos were establishing different forms of leadership in different seasons of the year simply because it was a survival tactic. Now, um, contact with European societies uh, would drastically, drastically alter the landscape of North America and those Native American societies that we have mentioned. Let me close with this. The one thing that I really want you to understand is we have a completely biased and completely uh, inadequate understanding of the world uh, that was here before Europeans started showing up. Okay? It's littered with Hollywood mythology, it's littered with racist kind of misunderstanding of that world, it's littered with their own, you know, maybe naive biases. The simple fact of the matter was, when Christopher Columbus arrived in the New World, what he saw was, it was kind of like a blip on the map. You know, it, it, what he saw was a world that had been changing for over 3,000 years. And after Christopher Columbus began to bring Spaniards back to the New World and colonize it, he brought yet another racial, ethnic, cultural, religious aspect to the Americas. Okay? I don't know if you remember me talking about creolization with the Aztecs, but this blending of cultures, that's exactly what you were seeing when Spain made contact with the New World.
But what's really important for you to understand is that had already been happening. Creolization had already been happening for thousands and thousands of years before Europeans showed up. Let me close with this. In the last 10 years, our understanding of Native North America has changed substantially. And I think in the next 10 years, what you're going to see is a really, really different understanding of the world uh, that Native Americans inhabited before Europeans um, were around. Now, with that said, there is a really important way that you can supplement this lecture. In other words, you can learn more, and I would highly, highly recommend you do so. In content in eCampus, there's a folder called um, Shaping America. It's a video series. It's a documentary series that was put together by my colleague, um, Dr. Ken Elfers. Um, I would encourage you to watch all of these lessons, but in particular for this, this specific lesson, um, I want you to tune in to lesson number one. So if you open up that folder, click the link, it's going to take you to a page. If you just click on lesson one, it'll take you through, um, it'll take you through Native North America. It'll touch on some of the societies that I have uh, outlined with you, but it'll also introduce you to other societies. Uh, it's approximately a half hour long, and each of these lessons that I'm talking about, these video lessons, are also about a half hour long. I would very much encourage you to do this over the course of the semester, but especially with this, um, with this particular uh, segment, considering it is so central to the first quiz that I've asked you to write. With that said, the next time we talk, I'm going to be talking about these worlds kind of coming together. In other words, Native America, Europe, and Africa becoming increasingly intertwined. Until next time.